were here to read, but still. Yes. And then Ukraine. Okay. Okay. So. Yes, I know. I think I got them. But it's not democracy. It is democracy. Must be Ukraine. There was a beautiful picture. Orban shaking his hand with Putin in Beijing. Yeah. At the beer. So it's a good inspiration for the for the. <laughs> you mean us and them? <laughs> exactly. Better, better when show you. I well. It's in Beijing. I, I and don't he's know. proud of it. He's not just pretending anymore that he's absolutely horrible. So I mean, we are all in a way because and we don't know what we can do with it. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> that's that's the big guy. Um, maybe we should start. Maybe we should start because we have only 45 minutes. We might go a little bit over time since there's just drinks afterwards. But I know you've been now involved in these discussions for very intense discussions uh, for two and a half days, almost three days. Um, I think Forum 2000 has been really amazing this year extremely dynamic uh, with such interesting speakers, uh, <coughs> discussions. So I'm sure we can take it um, further into you know, using this experience for pl practical applied policies. I always thought that politics and policies were applied social science thinking. So let's do a little bit of, of that. Uh, I have a fantastic group of speakers, uh, as you can see uh, around, uh, around this panel. So I will, well, I will just introduce them by, by names. This is the speaker of the uh, Chamber of Deputies of the Czech Parliament, Mrs. Marketa Pekarova Adamova. Uh, Mrs. Ivana Klimpush Tsintsadze, uh, chairperson of the Committee on Ukrainian Integration into the European Union in Vrhovna Rada, in the uh, Ukrainian Parliament. Mrs. Raukaya Kasenali, chairperson of the Electorate Institute for Sustainable Democracy in Africa. And Mr. Nuri Turkel, uh, Commissioner, U.S. Commission on Inter okay. International Religious Freedom, U.S., China, Uyghur, I'm always saying that because <laughs> it does give you a tinge. <laughs> I will start with <coughs> Ruka with you, if this is okay. Uh, we've heard really interesting things. We are from different, to some extent, from different regions and different parts of uh, the world. If you think of the last two and a half days, what do you think you can take away from this conference that would help Africa as a region and also, of course, that would, that would uh, help Mauritius as your country? <laughs> Thank you, Vesna. I think this has been a really enriching two, two, two and a half days because it started actually on Sunday. Uh, I think there has, what, what really struck me, because this is my first time to the forum, is that despite we come from different continents and different regions, there's a pattern, there's a trend of similarities, of issues, of concerns. Of, and and what, what's amazing, I think, is the ability to cooperate or the possibilities to cooperate on projects which we see similar. Uh, so certain issues that we've highlighted around, you know, uh, tech, 
around disinformation, around the types of cooperation that we want to have, because we see that very often there's a lack of information or there's a lack of evidence about what's happening in our countries or what's happening in our regions or what's happening in, in, in the continent. So I think that ability to connect and sort of see possibilities of collaboration. This morning, there was a very interesting uh, conversation we had in the breakfast meet around the fact that, you know, our governments, our leaders speak to each other, but us, we very rarely speak to each other. So I think this point of commonalities and being able to sort of establish a framework, a cooperation. And in fact, what also is very interesting is that we are launching the uh, the Democracy Solidarity Africa platform. In fact, we are 30 of us uh, in coming to the conference. And I think that is very interesting because very often we, are, we operate in a rather siloed approach that we know the concerns and, and the happenings in our areas, but rarely do we connect. So I think this is a, if it is anything, it's a great opportunity to network and a great opportunity to bring and to amplify. We've been talking a lot about the word amplification you know, the, over the last two days and a half. And I think the amplification, amplification of the voice of the people because very often the conversations we've had around, you know, big projects or tech or around foreign, uh, you know, interference, whether it's China, whether it's Russia or whether for that matter of fact it's in India, in my part of the world, the Indian Ocean, I think it, it has sort of, you know, removed the citizen, the average person from the conversation. So I think bringing it down to the people and engaging them in a conversation that matters for them because at the end of the day, I think the title of our, of our panel is about the future of democracy. And I think the future of democracy is really bringing it bite-sized value to the people so that they connect with the idea. And I know today we live in a highly autocratizing environment, you know, there are more autocrat autocrats than probably Democrats, and even those Democrats are starting to turn around and becoming more, you know, towards the autocratizing sort of uh, dimension. So I think, you know, conversations like that and connections and cooperation and learning from each other, because I think lessons <coughs> learned are very important. Very often we don't want to reinvent the, the, the wheel. The, Reinventing the wheel is expensive, it's time consuming, it becomes, you know, extremely capital intensive. So learning from each other would help. And, you know, I was thinking maybe doing an audit of our activities and seeing how we connect at all levels, at tech level, at civil society level, at educational level. This would really help us to sort of create that solidarity which I think very often is missing on our side of what we call the demand side aspect of democracy. So it seems simple, but there's a lot of work and ant work to do in connecting the dots and making it happen. Thank you so much. You're very much on the, uh, on the sort of point with, first of all, uh, mentioning how under the cer present circumstances, Demo even some Democrats are turning into autocrats. I was just shown a photograph of a former Democrat, Viktor Orban, uh, shaking hands with, with Vladimir Putin mm -hmm. in Beijing. So things are, in some cases, really looking serious mm -hmm. in, in that sense. And I think we have to, this was, a light motif of this conference, how can we prevent that? How can we actually make uh, democracy sufficiently resilient to prevent this backsliding, especially when uh, people in power who were elected democratically become very rich while they're in power? They almost, as yeah. a rule, tend to backslide. The Czech president yesterday, when he was participating in these discussions, yeah. said that one way of helping countries and helping other societies to sort of move towards democracy and develop democracy, and at the same time not being patronizing, which I think is, is an extremely important point, 
uh, is to talk about your own experience. Mm -hmm. Czechia has had incredible experience in that. A, in becoming a stable democracy. B, in rolling back an attempt to you know, slide, backslide on, uh, democratic, on this democratic realm. Uh, and I would like to ask you, Madam Speaker, how would you share and how did you see this experience? Because you actually did with a former Prime Minister, you did had, have, let's say, Orbanesque type of, of uh, <laughs> problems, uh, but you actually dealt with that. Please. Thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. When I'm thinking about, I think it's cooperation. It's uh, the reason why we were able to uh, face it, uh, this um, you know, risky times. We uh, were cooperating even though we are many parties uh, uh, those times in opposition, now in uh, the coalition and governing the country. And uh, what was said before, cooperation mm -hmm. is uh, very important, but it's cooperation of real Democrats, of people who are really valuing democracy and not uh, using it as a tool for their own uh, <coughs> goals, uh, but for the common goals. What I see uh, is uh, the very common for some Democrats who are then turning uh, through years to autocrats is that they are too long in the power. In, they are too long holding the power and uh, it somehow is changing your character, maybe. Not all the personalities are so strong to uh, be able to be really resistant. Uh, so I'm sure it's necessary to have in mind not only as uh, leaders of countries, but the leaders of parties. Uh, but democracy is uh, based on uh, uh, political parties and I'm sure that it's uh, necessary to have democracy within the party and to be able to really keep it uh, uh, for um, the main priority for all, all the members. As we can see this is not in all the parties in uh, the, our country as well but in the region as well in other countries and um, for example, in Slovakia, when we now see how long uh, you know, cooperation is between uh, Mr. Fico and uh, uh, other parties, uh, and they are really uh, just holding uh, in their hands power for their own aims, uh, then it's, it's necessary to uh, really uh, for a uh, the rest of society, especially, uh, I think this is important uh, to have uh, really engaged people who really want to uh, keep democracy, to raise their voices and uh, be able to face uh, with uh, cooperation of other, the same thinking people uh, to these threats. And um, looking to the past of the Czechia, Czech Republic, and uh, these decades, I think there are many people who have uh, the knowledge, uh, maybe better than I have, because I was, you know, growing uh, up the, those times in the 90s, and then. But I think we ha we were lucky with leaders. Mm. Uh, we were lucky with uh, Václav Havel, <laughs> for sure. sure and uh, he was a great model for uh, the next coming politicians and uh, people who were following uh, democratic ideas and values such as human rights, the rule of law, mm. and keeping it. I always say it's necessary to not only talk about the values, but act according to them. Mm. It's uh, much important than only talking, because we have seen many people who are talking, but acting differently. <laughs> and uh, this is necessary as well uh, to, um, mirror these people if they are saying something but according and not behaving according to uh, those words it's not um, not um, only up to them uh, to be able to uh, recognize it's up to the whole society so uh, it's necessary to face it and uh, we have very active society so I'm proud of we have uh, 
active media. And uh, these uh, Democrats who are turning to autocrats are using media as their own tool. They are turning them as well to uh, their um, portfolio of their methods. And it's not uh, uh, from one day to the next day. It's uh, the process. It's the slow process uh, where there, I think, are many times uh, people are just witnessing and uh, not trying to uh, to stop them. So it's necess necessary to be active. Vigilance. Thank mm -hmm. you very <laughs> very much. Uh, I think I will go to Ukraine before going to some some issues that we might want to add. Uh, Ukraine has been in our thoughts and in our discussions a lot, not only here, but in general. Ukraine is in a way uh, you know, standing on the front line of, mm -hmm. of all of us. Uh, there are a lot of, there's a lot of experience around here, uh, unfortunately also with wars, like in my case in the Balkans in the 90s. Uh, there is also a lot of experience with democratic transformation uh, that you know, we have done in countries that when I was young we couldn't dream of things like that happening. So it is possible. Mm -hmm. But Ukraine is dealing simultaneously with defending itself, with defending the democratic world, with state building under those circumstances and with EU transformation potentially or, or getting there, so to speak, towards the EU transformation. Um, there was also a lot of discussion about rebuilding after the war and even during the war of Ukraine. One thing that I think wasn't mentioned was Rebuild, there was a lot of discussion of rebuilding infrastructure, physical infrastructure, but rebuilding society. Uh, because you know, it's obvious that it's going to be extremely traumatized. So how do you coordinate all of these things? Are you getting ready to also rebuild, their, rebuild the society that was and is being damaged by this aggression on, on Ukraine? Uh, that we are witnessing. Vesna, you just suggested the whole topic for the next conference, I think. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it will be pretty difficult to, to try to address all these issues that you've mentioned. But let me start from something, uh, putting it on, on a wider scale. You know, while thinking about the topic of this discussion that, that we are having today and uh, kind of summing up the whole discussions over this uh, two forum days, I was thinking about uh, one speech that really struck me um, of, um, of High Representative Borrell when he was speaking a year ago to uh, the annual meeting of EU ambassadors. Because he said several things that I think have been actually also recognized here. He said that we have to accept that the, uh, the old world um, is, on a, is already not there. There is a new reality and we have to accept it. Then he said that the world is moving towards autocracies and uh, towards autocracy, and sometimes uh, in uh, democratic countries, um, these autocrats already are wearing a democratic suit. But we see this shift and sliding towards the the uh, kind of right-wing radicalism. And the third thing, and I think the, the most important thing for us uh, here, um, he said that it is not possible to exchange values uh, for heat, um, you know, electricity, food, uh, social standards, uh, for prosperity and so on, that they must go hand in hand. And I think what we are seeing right now, you know, we are so really grateful to all the nations that have stood up together with us when we um, had to push full-scale invasion of Russian Federation um, back but we also remember that we have been ringing these alarm bells that values should be protected. And it's important to protect uh, values and stand up to that and not take them for granted since 2014. And I cannot tell you that everybody heard. 
maybe listened, but not necessarily heard. So I think, um, you know, when we are talking about this, this uh, absolutely brutal and, and painful and challenging time for Ukraine right now, uh, obviously we are happy to see that the world has woken up to the challenge and is understanding that probably we have to give a rough response to, to dictatorships, to autocracies, to those who are attacking nations that do have the right to protect themselves and protect the values that they believe in and uh, have the right to transform as they wish. Uh, but at the same time, I think we still have uh, to do some lessons learned um, exercise uh, that should actually help us to preserve this um, dedication to further the cause that we are dealing with right now. Because I think everybody is also accepting that, you know, there is some tiredness, there is uh, loss, loss, um, um, we are losing the focus. We are also turning to so important things like inequalities, social standards, standards of living, and, and we understand that this is something very important for every single nation and every single society. But we have to understand that if we do not protect something, something very, very basic, we won't have the possibility to discuss and to see how to develop these other, other things that come <laughs> as a benefit of democracy and not vice versa. And so, how is Ukraine doing? Uh, obviously, it's, um, um, you know, we are talking here like how everybody is tired or fatigued or whatever, and we Ukrainians just don't have the right to get tired. Mm. Uh, we just know that we, ha in order to, to exist in order to survive, in order to have the future, in order to have the possibility to, tr to transform, we have to go on. And um, I was, it was interesting, uh, one of our colleagues here uh, said yesterday, while talking to Ukrainians, he was like, well, I was so tired already, but from you Ukrainians, I'm getting additional energy. So I'm happy if we're bringing back some energy. But that does not come uh, easily that energy and that, that, that striving for life, because we know that our lives are, are um, at stake, um, not, not only as a nation, but as individuals, as our families and so on. So therefore, we know that uh, in order to, um, to be successful, we have to manage all these goals that you were asking about. Um, transforming, fighting, uh, beating up the support for Ukraine in the future, um, and, and now also, because I think we, we are somewhere in the plateau of support and everybody thinks that maybe it's a good time to already rest on the laurels. Mm -hmm. I would encourage you not to. I think that, that we are not there yet. Um, and so, um, and whether we are thinking of restoring the society, definitely we are. Uh, we are thinking, but I cannot tell you that we have the, the you know, magic wand how to do that. We, uh, we know how hard it will be to return our people back. We are very grateful to all the nations who have, who have received Ukrainians uh, and have been making their homes open for Ukrainians. But for us to restore the society, not only physically to rebuild buildings or energy infrastructure or whatever, uh, infrastructure buildings, to, to restore the nation's um, vibe, if you wish, mm. we need to have young people back. We need to, for them to have the possibility to, to realize themselves in Ukraine. And that is something that we cannot ensure in the nearest future as we see how this war is ongoing. So therefore, uh, the task is much, much higher than, or, or much tougher uh, as we can deal with at this particular point. And so that's why I think we are prioritizing right now military aid, um, military effort, ability to try to, to push um, aggressor out and are hoping for, for all the further support. But at the same time, we started this transformation process that hopefully will allow us to bring our people back and, and have the incentives for them to live in a democratic, free um, nation that, that will be thriving and maybe hopefully will be example not only of the bravery but also of the success of, of development. Thank you. Of transformation, I mean, Carl Gershman is here, who many, many years ago helped us in Croatia deal with some of the things, even during the war, mm. supported us when we were trying to deal with the hate issue. Mm. And this is something that I just want to mention here, you will have. And 
that is important because it poisons your own society. It's not something We already that feel that. The Vesna, yeah. we already feel that, and um, there are even more different um, cracks that we are seeing mm -hmm. in the society. Because we will have to deal with, uh, not only with the hate that is um, against the enemy, but we also will have to deal with a traumatized society because every single person who have heard at least several times the air raid alert, not necessarily even experienced the, the, um, the, the, the rocket bombing, falling um, near you, is already traumatized. And we are all very much, um, you know, sometimes maybe here we Ukrainians might seem very emotional, but I think that that's, uh, that's just part of where we come from and, and how we are functioning at this particular moment. Uh, so we are already feeling this. We, are f we, we, we think, we can see that already, that people uh, who kind of admit um, that when they are analyzing their own personal behavior, there is also a crack among those people who have stayed in the country and who have fled the country exactly. That's for, going to for, be big. for life. Uh, and we understand that, that you know, we will have to, to, to mend those fences. And right now the government has come up, for example, with the idea that we have to kind of look for incentives and, and you know, special credits for those who will come back and so on. And so people who, are, who have been staying saying, well, should I have left in order for me to have some additional preferences from the state? Mm -hmm. So it's difficult. We are learning on the way yeah, as well when we, while job. we are thinking how to deal with those issues. Thank you very much. I'm really, really glad to hear what you said that you know, there is, is an awareness. We dealt with many different issues during these discussions in this conference, but I'm sure there are some that we didn't deal with and that we didn't discuss. So maybe you can bring up some, some of those issues, uh, Nuria, and some of the things that you saw as missing from the discussions this year. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to thank your government, your parliament, for formally recognizing the atrocities committed against the Uyghurs as a genocide back in 2021. That meant a lot to my people. Uh, we share that sentiment the traumatization. I've been traumatized, even though I live as a, a free human being in the United States. Uh, the geographical location does not really um, make any difference when you deal with a situation like this. So it means a lot to me and my fellow Uyghurs uh, all around the world. Um, the points that have been, uh, been discussed um, in the last two days um, uh, missed out a few things. First, um, it is it is absolutely necessary that we talk about Putin's plan for the world, but we cannot ignore CCP's plan for the world. Uh, the elephant in the room is the CCP. Um, as Vesna pointed out, there's an actual part of CCP's strategic plans being in the works today as we speak in Beijing uh, through the BRI initiative. China has been um, implementing both uh, repressive policies and aggressive foreign policy around the world. Uh, through uh, exportation of its um, uh, repressive uh, tools, specifically uh, digital uh, uh, equipment uh, and, and methods that have been metastasizing. Uh, uh, as we speak, there are about 80 countries that includes uh, liberal democracies like Germany, New Zealand, have imported uh, Chinese surveillance techniques, surveillance techniques that is becoming a part of life. Uh, the evil genius of the Chinese digital uh, surveillance equipment is to make people to go about with their lives. Eventually, they stop worrying about it. But what comes after that is uh, the threat to civil liberties, uh, democratic norm. The, the Chinese tech revolution has two significant or key components. One, the China wants to be a prime, uh, wanted to be a leader in a emerging technology, specific in AI. Today, uh, there are 75 countries uh, using AI. 50 of them are using Huawei uh, AI technology. 60 of them are connected to the Chinese technology. Not only that, the Chinese domestic market for surveillance cameras have been saturated. Uh, Hikvision, for example, installed 400 million uh, security cameras all around the country. 
they need to find a new market. They also use this uh, to push back or undermine democratic norm. So domestic repression is not enough. The Chinese have learned the lesson from the uh, 1980s revolution in this part of the world. And they, they come up with this idea that we have to prevent the revolutions outside of the country affecting the potential political unrest in the homeland. Therefore, they come up with this new uh, method. It's called preemptive policing. Um, the case in point, the Uyghur genocide it's, is, is, a, is a prime example. So they believe that the Uyghurs will rise up and pose potential political threat, showing disloyalty to the party uh, uh, through their religious belief, ethnic uh, identity, way of life. Uh, if not taken care of it, uh, this will spread to the vital organs of the state. For example, they liken the Uyghur uh, ethno-religious identity to uh, infectious disease that has to be cured. Uh, even in one instance, this top Chinese official used the term that uh, chemicals must be sprayed. Taking out the weed one by one cannot be an effective method. So they have this new uh, methodology that has, gaining, has gained ground in, in societies ruled by authoritarian regime uh, or dictatorship that uh, the countries don't need to beef up their police. They don't have to buy lots of guns and uh, even build a lot of prisons. The surveillance technology can prevent a lot of troublemakers before they start uh, rising up against the regime. The other point is, is also equally important, the economic dependency. Um, the world does not seem to be disturbingly learned the lesson from the Ukraine experience, the Russians' reinvasion to Ukraine. Uh, that dependency is mostly on, uh, on energy. When it comes to China, it's a global supply chain. Uh, this country experienced, this region actually experienced the first hand that the Chinese are sitting on the masks. The United States uh, lost 3,000 people daily because we didn't have enough ventilators. Guess what? They were coming from China. So on the critical supply, when it comes to even life and death situation for our fellow citizens, we have to beg the uh, CCP uh, rule China to provide the, uh, the basic needs. And, and now, uh, with the passing of the, um, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, United States have taken a lead. Uh, in 2021, U.S. Congress passed a massive, uh, uh, very significant bill to ban imports from the Uyghur region entering the United States unless proven with evidence that the forced labor is not used. Uh, 83 global brands have been imp uh, uh, implicated in this practice. If you add thousands of suppliers, making consumer goods that include solar panels, the uh, uh, pharmaceutical ingredients, uh, electronic components, uh, agricultural products, construction products, automotive parts. Anything that you touch today, uh, uh, possibly, uh, and also with uh, support with well-documented uh, reports, are made with the slave labor. And China, is, has, China has managed to normalize this uh, in, in certain parts of the world. And I, I have to be very critical of the European Union, European communities. Uh, they come up with this de-risking policy, but it, turning, it is turning into smokescreen. Where is the action? When would the Europeans will learn the lesson uh, from the Russia experience? This is, will be, uh, uh, if, if the China suffocates the European community and the uh, world, uh, global consumer communities, uh, the, what has happened uh, in the energy front with Russia will be almost like can be treated as child's playground. Uh, so, so the European community need to take an action in tandem with the United States uh, to, starting, uh, to starting with the action to um, eradicate forced labor products from the global supply chain. And then the third point is the transnational repression. Um, I don't know what, uh, if, if um, China's invasion uh, to our way of lives uh, through transnational repression, threatening our freedom of speech, threatening academic freedom, uh, in some instances punishing or taking uh, retaliatory actions against activists, or government officials, a uh, handful of European uh, uh, leaders in the parliament uh, have been sanctioned, I myself, um, for my service in the US government, have been sanctioned twice by Russia and Xi Jinping's China. So um, they have uh, also gone after ordinary citizens. 
And now we have found out through uh, an NGO with very limited funds that uh, a significant number of uh, Chinese police stations operating here in Europe and the United States, only two governments, the uh, United, US government and UK government, haven't, have taken an action. So when do we see actions from the rest of the Europe? When do we realize that our sovereignty, our privacy, our freedom are right, at stake? So this is one uh, issue. And then finally, uh, there's a thing called 14 plus one, uh, CEE -C -C -E -E China, that uh, the Czech Republic is a member of, a part of. Uh, we've been reading that Czech Republic will leave, uh, but it didn't happen. Uh, we cannot treat uh, in international bodies like the one, uh, 14 plus one, that China is spearheading and established. 16 plus 16 one. Plus one. It, the and number then Greece changed. joined, and then it was 17 plus one, but now it's coming down. So, so uh, that is one of the ways in which that China is using uh, as a platform to expand its uh, influence operations. So I would like you to take home these points. Uh, think about it. Uh, what kind of life do we want? Are we going to be able to live the life that we, we know in the past with this technological uh, advancement that has been, for the most part, is immoral on the Chinese part. And they're also making, because of the Western pressure led by the United States on technology, sensitive technology chips, they wanted to be able to self-reliant. And they have a slogan called, we have to be able to make choke point uh, equipments and, and technical skills. So they are marching ahead, but it seems like the rest of the world is sleeping at switch. Thank you very much. That's actually in a globally disrupted world. This is a very difficult task and very difficult objective that, and, and question that you have raised. Uh, almost every year there is another serious war. Putin has actually gotten you know, in, in uh, his second front now in Israel and Gaza that is distracting everybody's attention from Ukraine. We thought we are dealing with that. Mm -hmm. We at the same time have this issue of the so-called Global South that doesn't like being called Global mm -hmm. South, which I agree with, but just for short, <laughs> uh, that has to work with somebody. And they have problems with the West and, and especially with the United States. A lot of Chinese influence is present there. How do we deal with that mm. issue? Maybe just a short input from, from, yeah. uh, from you. Yeah. I mean, this, yeah, yeah. absolutely, this Global South got you know, accelerated as well following the BRICS movement and this sort of an understanding of a different uh, alternative uh, architecture that's going to be pushed for the representation of, of, of what is supposed to be the Global South. For me, again, a continent where I come from, 40, 54 countries with so many differences, with so many, uh, you know, particularities. But I think I th one thing that we, from the continent, we are very much concerned and are very much aware of is about we do not want to be the proxy of anyone. You know, we have had colonial past and we are now having new colonial uh, sort of presence on the continent, in the in oceans where we are. And I think what really sort of is important for us is this agency that we need to be our own masters and we need to be able to make the choice we need to be able to make that ownership we need to be able to be at that central point of decision making we don't want this push and pull because at the end of the day you know for too long africa has been that scramble uh, for resources so i think here how we do we address this issue of you know what matters to our people and what matters to our, 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 our societies, because you talked about how do we mend societies and how do we uh, you know, empower societies. I think it's about information. Yet we are at the heart of a disinformation sort of warfare. You, you have different types of warfare. So I think you know, the institution that I chair, uh, ISA, you know, we are really at the center of quality elections. We, you know, election, there was this idea that elections was an important component of, of, of democracy, yes, but we've seen so many times that election created violence. Elections were 
stolen or we had st stuffed ballots and, and so on and so forth. So I think, you know, uh, how do we really percolate this understanding and meaning and the value of democracy? Because, you know, I'm a democracy scholar. I call myself a democracy scholar. But when you go to the average person, they don't understand what democracy is. You know, it's a very, very elitist, technical, intellectually driven type of conversation we are have, that we have between ourselves. So I think how do we really start to mend things and how do we start to strengthen things and how do we create resilience? Because I think for democracy to be saved, it has to be meaningful. It has to be relevant to the livelihoods of people. And when you talk about the livelihoods of people and when you talk to people, it's about equality. It's about social justice. It's about getting a job. You know, something that about the African continent as well uh, is that we have a youth dividend. And many of the youth, when you talk to them, you know, it's about equality of chances and we want a job you know so i think it's about percolating these fundamental thematics uh, to, to 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 and providing those services we talked about uh, social services so i think uh, during the conversations in the last two days we talked about a new social contract and i think this is what really matters to the lives of people uh, you know what's happening with the proxy wars and what's happening and what is the possibilities of China offer or the India offer or the Turkish offer or the Russian offer or for that matter that our, our uh, colonial masters offer is that it has to make the lives of people better. And that brings you back to the types of leaders because I think you mentioned about the deficit of leadership. Today, unfortunately, there is a deficiency of good leaders and it's not you know, only happening in, 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 you know, in, in problematic places, but it's happening in where, 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 where countries that used to be leaders, the US, for example, you know, today we have this big problem. So I think uh, th there are many problems, but not something that we cannot deal with, because I think optimism is extremely important. The, 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 the possibility of hope, and the politics of hope so that we can transform because transformation is fundamental because at the end of the day when you transform societies and people living in those societies see the, the possibility of that transformation then they embark and they are onboarded into those processes but I think uh, until we and, and you know observing politics in many parts of Africa is that Politicians are, have the greatest intentions and the best intentions when they are in opposition. <laughs> and the it's moment that they come... Not only in Africa. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's, that's a trend. And the moment that they come into power, they forget, you know, and I think this urge and this desperation to remain in power is so strong. And, you know, so, so one last thing is that I, we need to bring back, you know, people to to value politics and to vote because we see apathy across board. And when apathy settles in, you know, there's a void. And when the void happens, then you have, you know, all sorts of malignant forces that enter the process and, 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 and you know, create a situation that might be of no return. So for me, you know, agency, you know, space for decision making, uh, autonomy is very important for us to make our mistakes and own our mistakes. It's our mistakes, it's not others making us make those mistakes. So, I mean, it's rather philosophical and it's rather sort of, but I think we need to start from that value sort of ladder to be able to sort of recreate the trust in politics, recreate the trust in our institution and that people can be the drivers of change. I very much appreciate uh very much appreciate your point of um, making it understandable and relatable mm. to people. And for that, if the one, the, those of us who can remember, when we started in Eastern Europe, it was freedom. Mm. Freedom was the concept. Yeah. And what everybody was talking about was you know, freedom and truth. Truth was also extremely important as a concept, and as we know from you know, the founder of, of this okay. forum and the probably most famous essay uh, 
in a long time, if not of, of all times in, in yeah. at least 20th century, was this, this uh, Havel's essay, Living in Truth. This, is, uh, this was actually, dem democracy came later as a concept. We started with something that everybody could relate to, yeah. which was you personally want to feel and be free. And you also yeah. re refuse to be lied to, mm -hmm. because that was uh, uh, lying was, of course, it's in vogue again. But lying was a big instrument of of the authoritarian uh, okay. and dictatorial regimes uh, mm -hmm. in the old days. And something that was also mentioned, and if I may end this with with a short question to you: Good leaders. We lack good leaders. How do we, well, where do we look for them? Uh, <laughs> is it something that can replace people like, I don't know, Adam Michni, Geremek, uh, uh, Havel, uh, Elmer Honkish, incredible people that led in the first years of transformation in Eastern Europe? Oh, what a <laughs> Tough question. <laughs> uh, but what I think is uh, that we don't lack leaders, but we lack uh, support to them and uh, among a civil society. Mm -hmm. And uh, now it's so easy, so, so easy to challenge someone with uh, all the hate speech and uh, all the, you know, uh, hoaxes and uh, fake news uh, because it's spreading uh, so quickly and uh, this is a huge challenge for all of us uh, to really not with all these things we are facing in politics as well not only in politics but as well in the society for all as well uh, all uh, you know uh, people who are in uh, uh, in um, arts and other other fields, mm. we all are facing this, and it's only for strong personalities. Of course, uh, those people were as well strong personalities. They faced uh, uh, many many uh, difficulties and obstacles in their lives, uh, such as uh, they were in prison and so. I'm thinking about uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, for example, as a true uh, leader for these days, we can see that we have leaders. But what they need, they really need to uh, feel the support of uh, the um, s people who are in like-minded and who are uh, thinking in the same way. And uh, at the same time, I think uh, what's uh, important, back to the basics, because now it's the same. We are lacking uh, the truth. Uh, sometimes, because it's overwhelming all of us, all the environment, all uh, these hoax, fake news, and uh, the un another word for this, it's not the truth, it's, of course, the lie. And um, that's why I think we all should uh, be asking for the truth, for the truth from politicians and uh, for the truth of the rest of society as well, because um, this is important. And what I think um, is the last, uh, last um, thought when we were talking about, you were talking about democracy. Uh, Madeleine Albright said, democracy has to deliver. Mm. This is the thing. Democracy has to live, deliver to all the people. And uh, we should have on our mind all the time that this is something which is meaningful, uh, but uh, prosperity, uh, human rights and uh, as well dignity of people is not um, in any other type of uh, the system, yeah. only in uh, democracy. Yeah. And it's true that uh, maybe we should not talk too much about democracy, we should talk about these things. Uh, these things which are uh, the, the such meaningful for uh, keeping it and uh, this is still the process. It's the process to keep the democracy everywhere. It's up to us. 
Thank you very much. Uh, we are about six and a half minutes over time. So I will give you each a very short, because also Nuri wants and and, and yep. Damara. So go ahead. Uh, two, two points, um, picking up what um, Merketa was saying about the uh, fake news. The disinformation today is uh, a state policy in China, for example. TikTok has, has 150 million uh, subscribers in the United States. TikTok is owned by ByteDance. ByteDance has a uh, contract with the Ministry of Public Security and a joint venture with two Chinese state-owned media. So today, the international news consumers, specifically youth, are getting their news from the CCP. So that's something to think about. And then the other thing, when we talk about the, the, the Chinese telecommunication technology, keep in mind that they are wiring the world. Once that cell tower is up, submarines are installed, you're locked in. It's not easy to replace, easy to remove. So be very, very mindful when we advocate for uh, privacy, uh, the real news, we have to keep in mind that there's something very big happening in the background. Thank you. Please. Just one word. I think um, it's important for us to understand with all the goodwill that comes from democratic societies and from democratic yeah. values, we have to understand that democracy has to be with the feast. And it does have to be able to protect itself. And that means being ready to give a rough response to those who are trying to attack the very basics of it. And that sometimes it's a technological response, sometimes it's economic response, sometimes it's military response. But we should not be afraid to act. And this is something that where uh, democracy feels weak when it is hoping that maybe by talking uh, yeah. we can get to the point with those who actually do not understand any arguments. So it's about our strength and readiness to act to protect what we believe in. Thank you. It has been, sorry, <laughs> we are way over time. Uh, I want to thank the panel. I want to thank Forum 2000 and the staff, Jakub Klepal, and all the people that worked on this, which was amazing. <laughs> and, and let our panel leave you with the four concepts uh, that we need to bring back and put in the center. This is freedom, truth, leadership, and proactive democracy. Solidarity. Uh, there are a few others, yeah. But let's, <laughs> let's stick with these. And I have also one more task, and this is to remind you that as you will be exiting uh, this hall, uh, you will receive pieces of paper on which you have to write, you have to write, please write, um, <laughs> the answer to the question. Imagine you're a journalist writing about this conference. What would be the headline of your article? So please write your headline. Thank you very much, Jakob. Thank you very much, the, uh, our forum. And thank you very much, everybody, for being here and making this such an exciting two and a half days.